You're good. And yo. An impossibly huge castle of rock and iron floating in an endless expanse of sky. That is the entirety of this world. A tireless month-long survey by a team of fanatical experts found that the base floor of the fortress was more than six miles in diameter, just large enough to fit the Setagaya War of Tokyo inside. And considering one of the hundred floors stacked on one on top of each other, the sheer vastness of the structure beggared the imagination. It was impossible to estimate the total amount of data it all represented. Inside the castle were several bustling cities, countless smaller towns and villages, forests, plains, and lakes. Only one staircase connected each floor to those adjacent it, and these staircases were located within dangerous mazes filled with monsters. It was difficult just finding them, much less reaching them, but once someone had cleared the stairs and arrived at a major city the next floor up, a teleport gate linking the two floors would open in every city below, allowing all players instantaneous travel among the various levels of the castle. It was thus that over two long years, its inhabitants slowly but steadily conquered this giant fortress. The current human frontier is the 74th floor. The castle's name is Aincrad, a floating world of blade and battle of about 6,000 human beings trapped within otherwise known as Sword Art Online. The dull gray point of the sword chipped my shoulder. I felt a chilly hand squeeze deep within my chest as a thin line fixed to the corner of my vision shrank slightly. That blue horizontal line, my HP bar, was a visualization of my remaining life force. I still had more than 80% of my maximum health remaining, but a wiser perspective said I was 20% closer to the brink of death. Before the enemy's blade could begin its motion again, I darted backward to maintain the distance between us. Ha! <sighs> I forcefully exhaled and took another breath. My virtual body in this world required no oxygen, but back on the other side, my flesh and blood form was no doubt panting, panting heavily as I lay prostrate on my bed. And cold sweat would be glistening on my outstretched hands, my pulse racing without end. It was only natural. Everything around me was a virtual 3D object, the only thing I'd lost being abstract numerical hit points, but my life hung in the balance all the same. In that sense, this battle was the ultimate injustice. The enemy before me, a half-man, half-beast monster covered in slick green scales with long arms, the head of a lizard, and an elongated tail, was not only inhuman, it wasn't even truly alive. It was a mass of digital data that could be rebuilt by the system endlessly, no matter how many times it was killed. Okay, it wasn't that simple. The lizard man's AI program was observing my fighting style learning my habits and sharpening its reactions moment by moment. But the instant that this individual creature died, the information would be reset rather than carried over to the next lizard man to pop into the area. So in a sense, this lizard man was alive. It was a unique individual, one of a kind. Right. It couldn't have been, it couldn't have understood what I was muttering under my breath. But the creature, a level 82 monster called the Lizard Man Lord, exposed the needle fangs lining its slender jaw and hissed a laugh at me. Anyway, it's real. Everything in this world is real. None of it is artificial. I held out the long sword in a straight line, chest high. The Lizard Man raised the buckler on its left arm and drew back the scimitar in its right. As we paused, a chill breeze emanated from beyond the dim labyrinth corridor, rippling the torches along the wall. A flame light flickered off the damp stones. <laughs> With a vast roar, the lizard man lord leaped forward. Its scimitar darted for my stomach in a sharp arc, a brilliant orange curve flashing through the air. Fell Crescent was a high-level heavy attack skill for curved swords, a deadly charging blow that covered a distance of four yards in just .4 seconds. But I knew it was coming. Keeping my distance was the entire plan, as I was daring the enemy AI to use against me. The scimitar blade passed just inches from my face, 
my nose wrinkling at the charred odor left in its wake. I ducked, pressing up against the lizard man's belly. With a cry, I slashed my weapon sideways. The blade, glowing cyan, sliced through the scales of the creature's soft underbelly, spraying beams of crimson light in place of blood as a dull grack sounded from above. But my combo continued unabated. The system automatically assisted my further assault, chaining into the next attack faster than I could have moved on my own. This is the advantage of sword skills, the most significant and decisive feature in the battle of this world. As the sword leaped from left to right and found purchase in the lizard man's chest again, I followed that momentum to full body spin and drove my third blow even deeper into the enemy's core. No sooner had the lizard man regained mobility than a loud roar of rage and fury, swinging its scimitar down from on high. But my combo wasn't over yet. From its full extension to the right, my sword shot diagonally left and upward like a spring, striking directly the enemy's heart, its critical point. This four-stroke combination left a square of glowing blue lines extending outward from me. Horizontal square, a four-part sword skill. The brilliant light reflected off the walls of the labyrinth, then faded. At the same time, the HP bar displayed above the lizard man's head vanished without a trace. As it unleashed a long, final scream, the massive green form threw itself backward, paused at an unnatural angle, and exploded into a mass of delicate polygons of a blast like the shattering of a huge glass structure. This is death in the virtual world, instantaneous and simple. Utter annihilation without a trace. A purple font in the center of my view popped up, listing my experience and item rewards. I swept my sword back and forth before returning it to, my sh to the sheath over my shoulder. Backing up several steps to rest against the wall of the dungeon, I let myself slide to a sitting position. When I released the breath I'd been holding and shut my eyes, my temples began to throb dully with the fatigue of the long fight. I shook my head several times to clear the pain before opening my eyes again. The clock display in the lower right hand corner of my vision showed that I was already past three in the afternoon. If I didn't leave the maze soon, I'd never get back to town before dark. Better turn back, I muttered, to no one in particular, and slowly rose to my feet. It was the end of a full day's worth of progress. Another day of successfully eluding the grim reaper's grasp. But once I returned to my bed, I took a short rest. The next day would bring another endless series of battles, and when the combat is endless and the stakes are fatal, all the safety nets and backup plans in the world won't prevent Lady Luck from betraying you at some point down the line. The only real issue was whether or not the game could be beaten before I could draw the Ace of Spades. If survival was your top priority, the smartest play would be to remain in the safety of town to the day someone else beat the game. But the fact that I spent every waking moment testing the front line on my own, risking death for ever greater statistical rewards, meant one of two things that I was either a tried and true VR MMO virtual reality and massive multiplayer online addict, or a damned fool so arrogant as to honestly think he could free the world with his sword arm. I started making for the exit of the labyrinth, a self-deprecating grin tugging at the corner of my mouth. I thought back to that day, two years ago, the moment that everything ended and began. Ugh! Yeah. The strained cry cries were paired with desperate sword swipes, the blade swishing through nothingness. The blue boar charged its attacker the next instant, nimbly evading his slashes despite its massive bulk. As I watched the beast flat now throw him skyward to roll across the field, I couldn't help ha but ha laughing aloud. <laughs> Not like that. The important part is your very first motion, Klein. Yeah! Very bastard. As the boar's attacker, my party member Klein, rose to his feet swearing, he shot back a pitiful reply in my direction. 
Easy for you to say, Kirito. He can really move. I only met this man just a few hours earlier. His reddish hair flared back by the bandana tied to his forehead. His lean figure clad in simple leather armor. If we had introduced ourselves with our real names, it would have been hard not to use polite honorifics. But these were character names we'd chosen specifically for this virtual world. He was Glyde, I was Kirito. Attaching his son to each other hero would have just been weird. Noting that Klein's legs were unsteady and his spill had probably dizzied him, I leaned down to the grass on my feet, scooped up a rock, and held it above my shoulder. The system recognized this motion as the initiation of a sword skill, and the stone began glowing a faint green. The rust happened nearly automatically. My left hand flashed, and the rock flipped traced a bright arc through the air, striking the blue boar between its eyes as it prepared to charge again. The swine uttered a squeal of rage and turned at me. Of course it moves. It's not a training dummy. As, but as long as you initiate the motion and get the sword skill off properly, the system will ensure that it hits the target. Motion. Motion. Klein muttered the word like a spell, waving the cutlass in his right hand. The beast, properly known as a frenzied boar, was only a level one mob, with all the missed strikes and painful counterattacks. Klein's HP bar was nearly half gone. Dying wasn't a big deal, since he'd simply revive at the nearby starting town, but we'd have to trek all the way back here to the hunting grounds again. This fight could only last one more round. I tilted my head in hesitation as I deflected the boar's charge with my sword. How do I explain this? You don't just hold it up, swing it, and cut the enemy like one, two, three. You have to pause just enough in your first motion to feel the skill queue up, then kapow! You blast it into him. Kapow, huh? Klein held his, sir, his curved sword at mid-level as his handsome features crumbled into a pathetic grimace beneath the tasteless bandana. He took one deep breath in and out and lowered his waist, then lifted the sword as though to cradle it on his right shoulder. This time, the system recognized the required motion, and his arced blade glinted orange. Ah! he roared, and in a much smoother motion than before, he pounded forward with his left foot. A satisfying shing sound effect rang out as his blade carved a path the color of fire. Reaver, a single-handed scimitar skill, caught the charging boar squarely on the head, wiping out its remaining HP. Its enormous bulk shattered like glass with a pitiful squeal, and purple experience numbers floated before our eyes. Hell yeah! Klein struck a victory pose, turned towards me with a huge smile, his hand held high. I returned the high five and cracked a smile of my own. Congrats on your first kill. Just remember, that boar was basically the wimpiest little slime in any other game. Are you serious? I was convinced he was a mid-level boss. Not a chance. I returned my sword to the sheath on my back, my smile fading into a wry grin. But behind the friendly teasing, I understood Klein's euphoria. Of my extra two months of experience in leveling, I had been single-handedly responsible for all of our battles so far, making this the first time Klein had truly tasted the pleasure of dispatching a foe with his own sword. As if to practice his lesson, Klein repeated the same skill several times, hooting and cackling while I turned to survey our surroundings. The field around us was brilliantly illuminated by sunlight, just beginning to take on a tinge of red. Far to the north lay the silhouette of a forest, while a lake sparkled to the south, and the walls of a town could be faintly glimpsed to the east. To the west was nothing but endless sky and golden clouds. We were standing in a field to the west of the town of Beginnings, the starting area at the south edge of the very first floor of Eingrad. Countless other players were no doubt fighting monsters of their own in our vicinity, but the scale of the space was so vast that there were none within eyeshot. Finally satisfied, Klein returned the cutlass to the scabbard on his waist and approached, scanning the horizon with me. No matter how many times I see this, I just can't bring myself to believe that it's all inside a game. Just because we're inside it doesn't mean the game world has absorbed our souls or whatever. 
All our brains are doing is bypassing our eyes and ears, taking in the information directly through the nerve gear. I spoke through pursed lips like a pouting child, my shoulders hunched. Yeah, well, you're already used to it. This is my first full dive into the game. It's unbelievable. What a time to be alive. You're acting like it's such a big deal. I laughed it off, but secretly agreed. Nerve Gear. The name of the hardware that runs Sword Art Online. This VR MMORPG, a virtual reality, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. But this machine is fundamentally different from the home TV gaming consoles of the past. Unlike previous hardware featuring two points of man-machine interface on a flat monitor and a handheld controller, the Nerve Gear has just a single interface, a streamlined piece of headgear that entirely covers the head and face. Countless transmitters embedded within the unit generate a multi-layer electric field that connects directly to the user's brain. Information is sent not to the eyes and ears, but to the visual and auditory centers of the brain itself. Not just vision and hearing. Touch, taste, smell, the nerve gear is capable of accessing all of the senses. With the headgear on, the chin arm locked in place, a simple link start spoken command instantly causes all external noise to fade out and plunges your vision into darkness. Pass through a floating rainbow ring materializing out of emptiness, you're in a different world entirely composed of digital data. In other words, this machine, released to the public in May of 2022, finally succeeded in creating a perfect virtual reality. The major electronics manufacturer that developed the Nerve Gear coined the term full dive to describe the act of connecting to the VR world. It was an all-encompassing isolation from reality, more than worthy of the term. After all, the machine didn't just provide virtual stimuli to all five senses. It also intercepted and collected the brain's commands to the body. It was a vert vital function in providing full control in the virtual world. In other words, if your mental commands to your real body were allowed to pass, you might run within the virtual world during a dive, but your real body would quickly slam into the wall of your room. And it was only because the nerve gear intercepted the signals from the spine to the body and converted them to digital information that Klein and I could race around the virtual battlefield, swinging our swords of abandon. You leap into the game. The sheer impact of this experience profoundly enchanted many gamers, myself included. Once you tasted a full dive, there was no going back to the world of touch pens and movement sensors. I turned to Klein, his eyes watering as he stared out the rippling fields and the distant city walls. So, is Sword Art Online your first Nerve Gear game, period? Yeah, Klein nodded, turning his gallant face to me like some proud samurai from the distant past. When he maintained a serious expression, he could have been the lead actor in a period piece, but this did not reflect his real-life appearance. He was nothing more than a virtual avatar, created from scratch out of a robust list of finely tuned parameters. Naturally, I had also chosen the look befitting a hero of a fantasy anime, almost embarrassing in its shameless elegance. Klein continued in a strong, clear voice, also like to be falsified. Actually, I got Sword Art Online first, so I needed to buy the hardware just to play it. I mean, the first shipment was only 10,000 copies, right? I'm one of the lucky ones, although, since you've been playing Sword Art Online since the beta test, that makes you ten times as lucky. There are only around a thousand testers. I guess you could say that, I scratched my head as he stared holes into me. I could remember as though it were yesterday the excitement and enthusiasm that swept through the media when Sword Art Online was announced. The Nerve Gear and its revolutionary new full die format were so novel that the actual software to, t to take advantage of it actually lagged in response. Initial offerings were simple puzzle and educational titles, a source of serious disappointment to full-blown game addicts like me. The Nerve Gear creates a true virtual world, but the effect of such freedom is entirely lost when the world you inhabit is so small that an impassable wall can be found within a hundred yards in any direction. Hardcore gamers like me were initially entranced by the experience of truly being inside a game, 
It was only a matter of time before we saw a killer title in one very specific genre. We wanted an MMORPG, an online game that hosted thousands of players in the same vast world together. Living, fighting, and adventuring. Just when in desire and expectations had reached their peak came the announcement of Sword Art Online, the first ever entry in the VR MMO genre. The game took place in a massive floating fortress made up of a hundred expansive levels. Armed with nothing but the weapons in their hands, players explored each floor, packed with fields, forests, and towns, looking for the staircase upward and defeating the terrifying guardian monsters in their quest to reach the top. Unlike typical fantasy-themed MMOs, the concept of magic spells had largely been excised from the setting, making way for a near-limitless combination of special attacks, called sword skills. This was an intentional move to maximize the full dive experience, forcing players to use their own bodies and swords to fight. Skills applied not just to combat, but also to crafting disciplines like blacksmithing, leatherworking, and tailoring productive endeavors such as fishing and cooking, and even creative pursuits such as playing musical instruments. Therefore, players weren't limited to adventuring within the vast virtual world. They could literally choose their own lifestyle within the game. If enough hard work, a player could buy a home, till fields, and raise sheep if he chose to. As details of these features trickled out in stages, enthusiasm among the gaming public rose to a fever pitch. A beta test was announced in which a thousand players would be granted access to the game before release to help stress test the system and isolate software bugs. The developer was quickly swamped with more than a hundred thousand applicants, which represented nearly half all the near gear units sold at that point. That I somehow managed to slip through the crowd into one of those valuable slots was nothing short of a miracle. Not only that, being a beta tester gave me priority access to the retail edition of the game when it hit the market. The two months of the beta test were like a fever dream. Even at school, my head was swimming with thoughts of my skill loadout and equipment. Once I got home, I dove into the game until dawn. In no time at all, the beta test ended. When my character data was erased, I felt like I had lost a part of myself. The day was Sunday, November 6th, 2022. At 1pm, Sword Art Online would finally go live to the public. I was ready a full minute, 30 minutes early, of course, logging in without a second hesitation and checking the service status to confirm that more than 9,500 lucky purchasers were bringing with anticipation just as I was. The major online retailers had sold out of their initial shipments in seconds, and brick and mortar shops had made the news with crowds lining up three days early to get copies of the game. In other words, everyone who managed to secure a copy of Sword Art Online was almost certainly a serious gaming ad. My first interaction with Klein seemed to support that assumption. As I logged into Sword Art Online and marched down the familiar cobblestones of the town of beginnings, I ducked into a back alley, heading for a particularly cheap weapons dealer. He must have noted my lack of hesitation and picked me for a beta tester. Hey! Spare some advice? Klein hailed me. Impressed by his utter lack of restraint, I tried to pass myself off as a helpful town guide NPC with a feeble, Hello, are you looking for the weapon shop? Soon we were grouped together into a party, followed by some hands-on combat lessons outside of the town, and here we were. Frankly speaking, I was at least as antisocial in the game as I was in real life, if not more so. I grew familiar with many other gamers during the beta test, but there wasn't a single one of them I'd have called a friend. But this Klein fellow had a mysterious ability to pass, to slip past one's defenses and latch on, and to my surprise, I didn't really mind. Thinking that I might actually be able to stick around with him, I opened my mouth again. So, what now? Want to keep hunting until you get the hang of it? You bet your ass I do! Or, normally I would. Klein's shapely eyes darted to the right. He was checking the time readout displayed in the corner of his vision. But I need to log out for a bit to eat dinner. A schedule of pizza delivery for 5.30. Now there's a guy who comes prepared, I sighed. Klein straightened up and continued as though he'd just thought of something. 
Uh, so I'm going to go back to the town of beginnings after this and meet up with some friends I made in another game. If I introduce you, would you want to add them to your friends list? Makes it easy to send messages to each other. Uh, hmm, I stammered. I found it easy to get along with Clyde, but there was no guarantee I'd hit it off with his friends. In fact, it seemed all too easy to envision feeling uncomfortable around them, which might th make things awkward with Clyde himself. Yeah, well, as I failed to give a clear response, Klein quickly shook his head in understanding. I mean, I'm not saying you have to. There'll be other chances to meet them. Sure, thanks for asking, though. I apologize, as Klein shook his head again. None of that! I'm the one who should be thanking you! You helped me out a ton! I'll make it up to you sometime. You know, mentally. He grinned and checked the time again. Alright, man, I'm gonna log out for now. Thanks again, Kirito. We gotta hang out sometime. As I reached out and grasped his extended hand, it occurred to me that this man was probably an excellent leader in that other game he'd played. Sure thing. If you have any questions, just ask. Yeah, will do. We released the handshake. This was the instant that Minecraft, the world of Sword Art Online, stopped simply being a fun game, pleasant diversion. Klein took one step backward, held out the index and middle fingers on his right hand, and swung them downward, the action that called up the game's main menu screen. With a sound like bells jingling, a translucent purple rectangle materialized in midair. I took a few steps backward myself, sitting down on a nearby rock to open my own window. My fingers traced the display as I saw the items I'd earned from finding boars. The next instant... Huh? Klein muttered, perplexed. What the heck? There's no log out button. At those last words, I stopped moving my hand and looked up. No button. I can't. We'll look closer, I said, exasperated. The tall, scimitar-wielding hero leaned over, his eyes wide beneath the ugly bandana as he stared at the window. At, in its default state, the elongated horizontal window featured several menu tabs on the left and a human silhouette on the right, detailing the user's inventory and equipment. At the very bottom of that menu was a logout button that enabled the player to leave the world. Or at least, there should have been. As I returned my gaze to the list of items I'd earned over the last few hours of battle, Klein repeated himself, louder this time. No, it's just gone. You should see for yourself, Kirito. I'm telling you, it has to be there, I sighed. Then tapped the button in the upper left of the screen to leap back to the main menu. My item storage display closed smoothly, returning the window to its default state. The silhouette reappeared, several equipment slots still empty, and the list of menu tabs appeared again on the side. With a familiar motion, I slid my finger down to the bottom button, and all of my muscles were solid. It was gone. During the beta test, in fact, just after logging in at 1 o'clock today, the logout button was right in the corner. Well, as Klein noted, it had simply disappeared. I stared at the blank space for several seconds, then moved my eyes upward, carefully scanning the menu tabs to ensure they hadn't simply changed positions when I wasn't paying attention. Klein tilted my head at me, his head at me, to sh as though to say, See? Gone, right? Yep, gone, I reluctantly agreed. He raised his cheeks in a grimace and stroked his shapely chin. Well, it is launch day. Bugs happen. I bet tech support is getting drowned in calls. They're probably tearing their hair out right now, he said nonchalantly, to which I gave the barbed retort. Is that all you have to say about it? Weren't you just talking about getting a pizza delivery at 5.30? Oh, crap, that's right. I grinned despite myself at the sight of him bolting upright, wide-eyed wide with alarm. The red glow of my inventory screen subsided as I discarded enough junk items to squeeze back under the weight limit. Standing up, I walked over to Klein, who wailed on about lost anchovy pizzas and ginger ale. Look, you should try opening a support ticket with the GMs. They might be able to boot you off from the system side, I suggested. I tried that, but there was no response. Man, it's already 5.30. Kirito, was there any other way to log out of the game? 
completed pathetically, his hands outstretched. My lazy grin stiffened. A vague sense of anxiety began to chill my spine. Let's see. Logging out. Logging out, I muttered. To leave the game and return to my room back in the real world was simply a matter of opening the menu window, hitting the logout button, then confirming the action when the safety prompt appeared. It was quite easy. But I didn't actually know of any other way to leave. I looked up at Klein's face above me and slowly shook my head. Nope, there's no way to manually log out other than through the menu. Oh, that's crazy! There has to be a way out of this! Klein wailed as though denying my answer to make it un would make it untrue. Go back! Log out! Exit! But nothing happened. Zoro Online did not respond to voice command. He continued shouting and chanting, eventually growing agitated enough to leap about until I called out in a low voice. It won't work, Klein. Emmanuel doesn't say anything about an emergency termination method either. But, but that's crazy. You know games are bugs, but not the kind where you can't even get back to your own home, your own body, your own free will. Klein turned around to me, his face aghast. I agreed with him. This was crazy. It was absurd. What was the reality we were facing? You've got to be kidding me. This can't be happening. We're trapped inside the stupid game. Klein ranted, breaking into a panic laugh. I know. I'll just power off the machine. Or rip the nerve gear off my head. Klein rubbed his hands over his head as though removing an invisible hat. But I felt the cold anxiety return. You can't do either of those things. We can't move our actual bodies. The nerve gear intercepts all the commands going from our brains to the rest of our limbs. I tapped the back of my neck with my fingers. The system translates those commands into actions within the game. It's the only way we're able to move our avatars like this. Klein fell silent and slowly lowered his arms. We remained locked in place for a moment, our minds racing. In order for the nerve gear to successfully create the full dive experience, it has to read the movement signals going from the brain to the spine, cancel them out, and translate them into digital actions within the game world. No matter how desperately I waved my arms inside the game, my real body would remain motionless on my bed, ensuring I wouldn't bruise myself in the corner of my desk by accident. What was that very feature that now physically prevented me from disengaging the dive? So, what does that mean? Does we either have to wait for the bug to be fixed or for someone to pull the headgear off of our bodies? Klein muttered, still dumbfounded. I gave him a silent Doesn't. nod. But I live by myself. Doesn't. You? I hesitated, and then answered honestly. I live with my mom and little sister. I bet that if I don't come down for dinner, Doesn't. they'll eventually force me out of the dive. Oh! How old's your sister? Klein leaned forward. His eyes suddenly sparkling. I pushed his head away. Huh? Yeah? And that sure you that sure got you to take your mind off the situation, didn't it? She's on a sports club at school and she hates video games. She has nothing in common with people like us. Besides, I waved my hand, trying to change the subject. Don't you think this is weird? Sure it is. The game is buggy. This isn't just any old bug. Not being able to log out is a huge deal. It could spell disaster for the game's future. Even as we speak, your pizza is getting colder by the second. That represents a real monetary loss for you, doesn't it? Cold pizza is worse than natto that doesn't get sticky, Klein muttered cryptically. I continued. A situation like this means the programmers have to shut down the servers and force the, all the players offline. Yet, even though it's been at least 15 minutes since we discovered this bug, not only are we still online, there hasn't even been an official announcement within the game. It makes no sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Klein rubbed his chin, finally looking suitably serious. His slender eyes glinted beneath the bandana, stretched over the high bridge of his nose. I listened to Klein continue, struck by how odd it was that I was discussing such real-world affairs with a person I'd only met by sheer chance, and would likely never see again if I simply deleted my game account. Argus, the game's developers, made a name for themselves based on their customer outreach. The fact that their first online game was so highly anticipated is a sign of how much trust the community has in them. Okay, and they ruined that reputation with such a stunning screw-up on the very first day. Exactly. 
Not only that, at Sword Art Online is a very first example of virtual reality MMO. This turns into a huge controversy. The entire genre could get regulated out of existence. Klein and I sighed slowly at the same time. Our virtual faces turned to each other. Einkrad's climate was attuned to the real life season, meaning that it was early winter in the game, just as it was outside. I breathed in the chilly air deeply, filling my lungs with virtual oxygen, and looked skyward. More than a hundred yards above, the bottom of the second floor glowed a faint purple. As I followed the flat, rocky surface toward the horizon, my eyes rested on the vast tower far in the distance, the labyrinth that would lead to the next level of the castle. Beyond that, I could even see the aperture on the far side of the floor. It was now past 5.30, and the sliver of sky to be seen shone over the vast distance was glowing crimson. The setting sun shone through, lighting the rippling fields with dazzling gold. I found myself at a loss for words, despite the gravity of our situation. The next instant, the world changed forever. Klein and I jumped to our feet, startled by a sudden ringing sound, blaring like an alarm at full volume. <laughs> What's that? We shouted simultaneously, then noticed each other's bodies, our eyes wide. Both Klein and I were enveloped in pillars of brilliant blue light. The scenery of the fields faded out behind the colored film. I experienced this phenomenon several, multiple times during the beta test. It was the teleport effect that took place when you use an item to travel instantaneously across the game. But I didn't have the right item, nor had I given the system any such command. This was a system-side force teleportation. Why was it happening without any announcement? As my mind raced, the light surrounding me pulled stronger, blocking my vision. The blue light faded, and the environment returned, but was no longer the evening field in which we had been standing. I was greeted by wide paving stones, trees lining the street, and a cleanly elegant medieval town. In the far distance straight ahead, a massive palace gleamed darkly. I recognized it instantly as the central square of the town of beginnings, the game's starting point. I turned to face Klein next to me, his mouth agape. We stared out at the sea of humanity pressed in around us. It was a teeming mass of beautiful men and women, a clash of bristling equipment and hair in every color of the rainbow. These were all fellow Sword Art Online players. There had to be several thousand people here. Nearly 10,000, in fact. It seemed likely that every single player who was logged into the game had been forcibly teleported to the square. For a few seconds, there was a tense silence as everyone took in their surroundings. Mutters and murmurs broke out everywhere, steadily rising in volume. Shards of conversation could be made out above the din. What's going on? Can we log out now? Hurry it up! The murmuring took on a distinct tone of anger and frustration, raised voices demanding the GMs come out to explain themselves. Abruptly, someone screamed, cutting through the noise. Hey! Look up! Klein and I instinctively raised our eyes, which were met with an unnatural sight. The bottom of the second floor, hanging a hundred yards above us, was bathed in a red checkerboard pattern. Looking closer, I could see that the pattern was made up of two pieces of English text. I could make out warning and system announcement in the red font. After my fleeting initial shock, the tension in my shoulders relaxed. Finally, the developers were going to give us an explanation. The roar in the square died down as the crowd strained its ears. Though what happened next was nothing like what I expected. In the center of the crimson pattern that covered the entire sky above suddenly sagged in the middle, pooling like an enormous drop of blood. The vicious drop slowly extended downward, but rather than breaking off and falling, it abruptly changed shape in midair. What emerged was the form of a giant person, at least 60 feet tall, clad in a robe with a crimson hood. But this wasn't quite correct. We were staring up at it from the ground at an angle that should have given us a glimpse underneath the hood. But there was no face. It was an empty space, the underside of the hood and the stitching of the seam clearly visible. The long dangling sleeves also contained nothing but a faint darkness. I recognized the shape of that robe. It was a signature outfit of official Argus GMs during the beta test. But at the time, male GMs were depicted as elderly magicians with long white beards, and female GMs were bespectacled young women. 
perhaps some technical issue that had prevented them from creating an avatar of the robe being the best that could be managed. But the sight of that empty void beneath the hood filled me with a wordless dread. The mass of players around me must have shared that apprehension. Mutters of confusion arose in waves. Is that a GM? Why doesn't he have a face? As if to quiet the murmuring, the right arm of the enormous robe suddenly shifted. A white glove peeked out of the pendulous sleeve, but once again, there was a stark separation between the robe and glove, with no flesh to be seen connecting them. Now the other sleeve rose in turn, the white empty gloves spread it apart, looming over ten thousand heads, and the faceless being opened an invisible mouth, or so it seemed. From above the crowd, a man's calm, deep voice cut through the din. Welcome to my world, dear players. I didn't immediately register his meaning. My world? The red GM robe meant that he possessed the ability to manipulate the world as he saw fit. If he was already a god, why did the need feel the need to announce it to everyone? As Klein and I stared at each other in disbelief, the robe figure lowered its arms and continued speaking. My name is Akiko Kayaba. As of this moment, I am the only human being alive with control over this world. Huh? I was so shocked that I did not... Not only did my avatar's breath catch its throat, the same thing likely happened to my real body. Akiko Kayaba! I knew that name. I could not not know it. He was a brilliant young game designer and quantum physicist who transformed the niche game studio Argus to one of the foremost developers in the business. Not only was he the executive director of Sword Art Online, he also designed the basic foundation of the Nerve Gear unit itself. Like most other hardcore gamers, I held a deep reverence for Kaya. I bought every magazine profile and reread his precious few interviews so I could practically quote them from memory. Just the brief sound of that voice conjured my mental image of Kaiba, looking smart in his ever-present white lab coat. But he always preferred to stay out of the spotlight, avoiding media attention whenever possible, and he certainly never stepped into an active GM role within a game like this. So why now? I stood stock still, urging my mind back into motion, trying to grasp the situation. But try as I might, the words that followed from the empty hood mocked my feeble attempts at comprehension. You have likely noticed by now that the log out button has disappeared from the main menu. This is not a bug, I repeat, this is not a bug. It is a feature of Sword Art Online. Feature? Klein muttered, his voice cracking. The smooth baritone continued, overlapping the end of his question. From this point onward, you will be unable to freely log out of the game until the summit of this castle is conquered. The word castle snagged on the inside of my brain. Where was there a castle in the town of beginnings? But my momentary confusion was instantly wiped away by his next statement. Furthermore, the nerve gear cannot be removed or shut down via external means. If forceful means of exit are attempted, a pause, a palpably heavy silence filled the air. Ten thousand breaths held in apprehension. The next words came with a slow, awful finality. The high-powered microwaves emitted by the nerve gear will scramble your brain and shut down your vital processes. Klein and I stared at each other for several seconds, our faces blank masks as though our brains themselves refused to process the words. But Kaiaba's simple ultimatum shot through my body from head to toe for palpable impact. Scramble our brains. In other words, it would kill us. Turning off the nerve gear's power, attempting to remove it from the user's head, would prove fatal, according to Kaiaba. Murmurs rippled through the crowd, but no one screamed or raged. Everyone present, including me, either couldn't or wouldn't process the implications of his declaration. Klein's hand slowly rose to his head, attempting to grasp the nerve gear that existed only in the outside world. He let out a dry, quick laugh. <laughs> What's he talking about? Is he crazy? It's not possible. The nerve gear is just a game system. You can't possibly, like, destroy our brains or whatever. Right, Kirito? He finished in a rasping shout. Despite his pleading glare, I couldn't bring myself to nod in agreement. The underside of the nerve gear helmet is embedded with countless transmitters that emit faint electromagnetic waves, 
capable of sending false sensations directly to the brain cells. It's a piece of ultra sophisticated cutting edge technology. It also works on the same fundamental principles as a home appliance that has been around for decades, the kitchen microwave. With enough power, the nerve gear could potentially vibrate the moisture in the brain cells, causing frictional heat strong enough to steam the brain from the inside out. But in principle, it's not impossible. But he has to be bluffing. I mean, if you just pull the plug on the nerve gear, how can it produce enough juice to do that? Unless it's packing some massive batteries. Klein understood exactly why I trailed off. He moaned, a desperate expression plastered across his face. But it is. I heard that a third of the Earth's weight is battery cells. But still, this is ridiculous. What if there's a blackout? As though he heard Klein's roar, Kayaba continued his proclamation. To be more specific, the brain frying sequence will commence upon any of the following circumstances. Ten minutes of no external power, two hours of network disconnection, removal, dismantling, or destruction of the nerve gear. The authorities and the media in the outside world have already announced the details of these conditions to the general public. At present, the friends and family of several players have already ignored these warnings and attempted to forcibly remove their nerve gears. The result being, the echoing metallic voice paused for a breath, that sadly, 213 players have already been permanently retired from both Aincrad and the real world. A single shrill scream rang out from somewhere in the crowd. The majority of players were stock still, unable, either unable to or refusing to believe, their faces displaying absent-minded smiles. Like them, my mind resisted Kaiba's word, but my body was more honest, my legs beginning to quaver. I hobbled backward, several steps on buckling knees, trying not to fall. Klein simply fell straight onto his rear, his face still empty. 213 players. Those words reverberated over and over in my ears. Was Kayaba telling the truth? Were more than 200 people who had been playing this game just minutes ago already dead? Some of them must have been beta testers like me. Possibly even people whose faces or names I recognize from my time playing. And now Kayaba said their nerve gears fried their brains and killed them? I won't believe it. I refuse to believe it. Klein muttered from the paving stones. His horse, his voice hoarse. It's just a threat. You can't do this. Quit dicking around at us around and let us out already. I've got better things to do than sit around while your little stunt plays out. That's all this is, right? A stunt. A bit of excitement to juice up the game's grand opening, yeah? The exact same thoughts had been racing through my mind at the exact same time. Kaiba's dry, practical announcement continued, disregarding the wishes of his captive audience. There is no need to worry about your physical bodies back in the real world. The current state of the game and today's fatalities have been covered far and wide on television, radio, and the internet. The danger that someone will forcefully remove your nerve gear is already much diminished. The two-hour offline leeway period should provide enough time for your physical bodies to be transported to hospitals and other long-term care facilities with proper security, eliminating concerns over your physical well-being. You may rest assured and focusing on conquering the game. What? A scream finally ripped out from my throat. What do you mean? Conquer the game? You can't expect us to sit back and enjoy the game when we can't even log out. I glared at the headless crimson rope stretching up to nearly the upper floor and continued bellowing, This isn't even a game anymore! And again, as though he heard my voice, Akia Kokayaba's monotone continued, However, please proceed with caution. As of this moment, Sword Art Online is no longer a game to you. It is another reality. The standard means of player resurrection will no longer function as they previously did. When your hit points dwindle to zero, your avatar will be permanently deleted. And I knew what he was about to say before the words even came. And the nerve gear will destroy your brain. I felt an instant urge to burst into a high-pitched laughter bubbling up from my gut and had to stifle the impulse. In the upper left-hand corner of my vision sat a thin bar glowing blue. When I trained my eyes on the bar, the numbers 342-342 popped up next to it. My hit points, my remaining life. If that number hit zero, I would actually die. 
The game console would fry my brain with microwaves and kill me on the spot, according to Kayaba. Yes, this was a game. A game in which my life hung on the line. A game of death. During the two-month beta test, I must have died a hundred times. When that happened, you popped back to life with a cackle in the Black Iron Palace to the north of the square. Free to rush back out to the battlefield. That's how RPGs work. You die and die, learning lessons each time and honing your skills. But now we couldn't do that? Die once and we were dead forever without even the option of quitting the game? This is ridiculous, I muttered. Who could possibly venture out into the dangers of the wilderness under these circumstances? Everyone was bound to stay within the safety of the town. But as though anticipating the skepticism of all players present, Kaiba issued his next challenge. There is only one condition to which he can be freed from this game. Simply reach the hundredth floor at the pinnacle of Aincrad and defeat the final boss who awaits you there. In that instant, all surviving players will be able to safely log out once again. A moment of sheer silence. I finally realized the meaning of his earlier phrase, conquer the summit of this castle. He wasn't referring to just any castle. He was referring to Aincrad itself, the mammoth floating fortress on whose very bottom floor we now stood, 99 floors stacked above our heads. Clear the hundredth floor, Klein shouted abruptly. He clambered to his feet and shook his fist in the air. W w we can't possibly do that. I heard the entire group of beta testers barely got through the very start of the game. He was right. A thousand players took part in Soda Online's beta test. And when the two month period was over, we'd only cleared the sixth floor. True, there were nearly ten times that number taking part in the game now, but how long would it take to reach a full hundred floors? My guess was that the entire square was wrestling with the same apprehension. The silent tension shifted to low rumblings, and I wasn't hearing sounds of fear or despair. Most likely, the majority of players here couldn't make up their minds whether this was true danger or simply a flashy opening ceremony held in poor taste. Kaiba's statements were so bizarre and dreadful to comprehend that the story lacked credibility. I tilted my head upward, glaring at the empty rope, desperately trying to adjust to this new reality. I couldn't log out. I couldn't get back to my real room, my real life. The only way that could happen is if someone reached the top of this castle and defeated the final boss. And if at any point my HP reached zero, I would die. Real death. I would cease to exist. But no matter how hard I tried to accept this information as truth, I simply couldn't. Just five or six hours ago, I'd eaten my mother's home-cooked lunch, spoken to my sister, and climbed the stairs up to my room. Now I couldn't go back? Could this actually be happening? The red robe once again preempted the thoughts of all present, sweeping its white glove and continuing in a voice devoid of emotion. Finally, let me prove to you that this world is now your one and only reality. I have prepared a gift for all of you. You may find it in your item storage. Without thinking, I made the two finger downward swipe to pull up the menu. Others around me made the same motion square filling with electronic chiming sounds. When I hit the inventory tab on the menu screen, I noticed something new on the top of the list. It was labeled Hand Mirror. Curious, I tapped the name and selected the Materialize button from the list of options. With a sparkling sound effect, the small square mirror popped into being. I reluctantly picked up the mirror, but nothing happened. All I saw reflected in the surface was the painstakingly crafted face of my virtual avatar. Tilting my neck, I glanced at Klein. Like me, the chiseled samurai stood staring at his, into his own mirror. Then, in brilliant light it enveloped Klein and several other characters nearby. Next instant, my vision went blank as the same light surrounded me. A few light seconds later, it faded, returning to the same old sights. Except... This wasn't the Klein I recognized. The mismatched plate armor, ugly bandana, and spiky red hair were the same as before. It was a face that had changed. The slender eyes were now bulging and round. The slender bridge of his nose was a beak, and his fine cheeks and chin were now covered in scraggly facial hair. His former avatar was a gaunt young samurai, and the new Klein was a wandering ronin, or at worst yet, a bandit. Forgetting everything for an instant, I muttered, Who are you? 
The man before me returned the question. Me? Who are you? In a flash of enlightenment, I understood the meaning of Kaiba's gift. Raising my own mirror again, I stared at the reflection within. Black hair in an inoffensive style. Gentle eyes set beneath long bangs. A soft, rounded face that still got me confused for a sister instead of a brother, when strangers saw me side by side with my sister. This, there was none of Kirito's previous heroic look. The face I saw in the mirror was the real-life face I'd been trying to escape. Oh, it's me, Klein murmured into his mirror, flabbergasted. We faced each other and shouted in unison, You're Klein? You're Kirito? The voice filtering function had apparently stopped working, shifting the sound of our voices as well. That was the least of our concerns. Both mirrors slipped through our fingers, hitting the ground simultaneously with a faint crack. A quick glance around showed that the prior gathering of widely colored, beautifully fantasy characters had changed dramatically. It was as though someone had taken the crowd of a real video game convention and given them swords and armor to wear. Even the ratio of men to women had gone frightfully askance. How was this possible? We had all gone from our virtual avatars to our real-life appearances. It was still presented in polygonal form with a few slight details left out. But the degree of accuracy was startling. It was like I had undergone a full-body scan. A scan. Of course, I muttered, looking up at Klein. The nerve gear has got those transmitters all over the underside of the helmet, including the part that covers your face. So not only can it read your brain, it also recreates your facial details. But what about my height and my weight? Klein peered around, his voice uncharacteristically quiet. The crowd of players, still staring about in amazement, had clearly lost a few inches in average height after the adjustment. Both Klein and I had set our avatar's heights to be about the same as our own, hoping to avoid throwing off our visual physical coordination during the full dive due to any changes in eye level. But judging from the crowd, the majority of the players had given themselves an extra six inches, if not more. But that wasn't all. The average girth of the crowd had swollen considerably as well. But the nerve gear could only scan our heads. How could it have gauged our body size? Klein had the answer. Wait a sec. I remember this because I just bought my nerve gear yesterday. It did that thing during setup phase. What was it? Calibration? It asked me to touch my body in all these different spots. Could it have been could that have been it? Oh, right. Of course. The calibration process was a measurement of how far the user needed to move to touch his or her body, such that the system could recreate the proper surface area digitally. In essence, it was enlisting the user's help to build an internal measurement of the user's body. It clearly worked. Every player in the world of Sword Art Online at this moment had been turned into a virtually perfect polygonal replica of themselves. The intent was obvious. It's reality, I muttered. He just said so. My avatar and my hit points are now my real body and life. Kayaba recreated our faces and figures to force us to recognize the truth. But, but Kirito, Kiline wailed, scratching his head as his eyes bulged beneath the bandana. Why? Why would he do something like this? I couldn't answer that. Instead, I pointed upward. Just wait. He's about to answer that, I'm sure. Kaiba did not disappoint. The solemn voice continued a few seconds later, bringing out from the blood-red sky. You are likely asking yourselves, why? Why would Akiko Kaiba, developer of Sword Art Online and the Nerve Gear Unit, do such a thing? Is it an act of terrorism? An elaborate kidnapping to extract ransom money? And for the first time, Kayaba's emotionless voice began to take on the faint signs of color. Despite the situation, I felt a hint of longing in his voice. But that couldn't be right. What I seek is neither of these things. I have no goals or justifications at this moment. In fact, this very situation was my ultimate goal. I created the nerve gear and sword art online precisely in order to build this world and observe it. I have now achieved that aim. After a short pause, Kayaba's voice is back to its usual monotone. This concludes the tutorial phase of Sword Art Online. I wish you the best of luck, dear players. His last word echoed briefly before dying out. 
The crimson robe silently ascended, the tip of the robe, the hood, melting into the system warning still displayed in midair. The shoulders, chest, arms, and legs followed into the blood-red surface, leaving a single outward ripple behind. The next instant, the giant wall of messages plastered across the sky disappeared as abruptly as it came. The wind blew over the top of the square, and the background music from a band of NPC musicians slowly approached from afar, bringing the life back to my ears. The game had returned to its original state. The only difference lay in a few very crucial rules. Finally, at long last, the throng of players exhibited the proper reaction. The square exploded into noise, convulsing with the sound of 10,000 voices all at once. This can't be happening! You gotta let me out of here! Screw this! Let me out! I want out of here now! You can't do this to me! I'm supposed to meet someone tonight! No! Let me leave! Let me leave! Screams, rage, shrieks, insults, pleading, roars. In the span of several minutes, we have been turned from players to prisoners. We held our heads, sunk our unk to our knees, shook fists in the air, grabbed others, and turned on one another. Oddly enough, the more the screaming continued, the clearer my thoughts became. This is reality. Everything that Ikea Kokaiba said was the truth. He, of all people, would be capable of this. The destructive, unpredictable nature of his genius was as it all part of his allure. I would not be back in the real world for quite some time, months if not longer. I wouldn't be able to see or speak to my mother or sister, and we'd never be able to do so again. If I died here, I was really dead. The nerve gear, game console, shackles, and guillotine blade all in one would fry my brain and kill me. I took a slow measured breath and opened my mouth. Come with me, Klein and grabbed his arm, his figure so imposingly tall, even after the shift to our actual body types, and quickly led him out to the hysterical mob. He must have been placed near the outset of the group, as it took little time to escape the crowd. I marched down one of the town streets radiating out from the square, and stepped behind a stationary carriage. Klein, I snapped the dazed man to the most somber toes. I could manage. Listen up. I'm leaving the city right now and heading for the next village. Come with me. I pushed on, my voice low, as Klein stared at me from beneath his hideous bandana. What he said is true, and we have to get stronger and stronger in order to survive. I'm sure you already know that MMORPGs are a battle over system resources, so there's so much in gold, loot, and experience to go around. So the more you win, the stronger you get. Everyone's going to have to the same idea. So you'll, so the fields around the town of Begins will be bled dry in no time. We'll be forced to wander around, endlessly waiting for mobs to repop. We need to take this opportunity to set up base in the next town. I know the way, and I know which spots are dangerous, and get us there safely, even at level one. By my standards, it was a marathon speech. But Klein listened to every word. A few seconds later, he grimaced slightly. But remember what I said earlier? I stayed in line all night with some friends from another game just to buy this. They were logged in. They must still be back in the square. I can't just leave them behind. I held my breath and bit my lip. The intention behind Klein's pennies of sir was plain as day. The jovial, faithful man couldn't leave his friends behind. He wanted to bring them with us, and I just couldn't agree to that. Even at level one, I was confident I could protect Klein alone from the more aggressive monsters along the route to the next village. But any more than that would make the risk too great. Well, if someone died en route, and as Kaiba said, had his brain fried, the responsibility would lie with me. The guy who wanted to leave our initial haven failed to keep everyone safe. I couldn't handle that unbearable pressure. It was impossible. Klein seemed to pick up on the momentary hesitation once again. A stiff but broad smile cracked his stubbly cheeks, and he shook his head slowly. Nah, I can't ask for any more of your help than I've already, you've already given. Hell, I was a guild leader myself back in the last game. Don't worry, I'll get by with the techniques you taught me. Besides, there's always the possibility that this really was just a bad prank, and we'll be able to log out in no time. So go on, jump ahead, I don't mind. For a few seconds, I stayed silent, grappling with a conflict the likes of which I'd never faced before. Then I spoke the simple words that I would grow to regret over the following two years. 
Okay, I nodded, taking a step back. In hoarse voice, I continued. We'll part ways here, then. Shoot me a message if anything comes up. Well, see ya, Klein. As I averted my eyes and tried to turn away, Klein barked out, Kirito! His glance said he wanted to ask something, but his cheekbones only twitched and no words came out. I waved and turned northwest, the general direction of the village I sought to go next. After five steps, I heard his voice call out behind me again. Hey, Kirito! Turns out you look pretty cute after all. Just my type. I grimaced and called back over my shoulder. And you look ten times better now that you're a mountain bandit. Having turned my back from the first run I ever made in this world, I started walking forward. After a few minutes traveling down the twisted back alleys of the city, I turned around to look. There was no one there, of course. Gritting my teeth and swallowing the strange sensation that seemed to block my windpipe, I picked up my heels and ran. First the northwest gate of the town of Begains, then a vast field and a deep forest, finally a little village. I raced onward toward what lay beyond, headlong into a lonely battle for survival without end. Two thousand players were dead within a month. In that time, we never received a single message from outside, much less any kind of resolution to our crisis. I didn't stick around and see it for myself, but tales of the panic that erupted when it finally sank in that there was no escape told of sheer madness and chaos. The crowd wailed, cried, and raged. Some even claimed they would destroy the game world, making futile attempts to dig up the cobblestones of the city square. Needless to stay, the structures were permanent and movable pieces of the game environment. The demolition didn't last long. It took several days for full acceptance of the status quo to sink in, and new plans to emerge. The players split up into roughly four categories. First, and largest of these groups, at nearly half the game's population, were those who chose not to believe Akiyago Kayaba's conditions for release and simply waited for hope. Their reasons were painfully understandable. Our bodies were sitting on chairs or beds in real life, living and breathing. Those were our real selves, and what happened here was just temporary. One simple little change of circumstances and we could go back. If not the, the logout button in the menu, perhaps, but surely it was something if we just figured out what it was. The other source of hope was that the game's developer, Argus, to say nothing of the government itself, was most certainly making every effort possible to rescue us. If we were simply calm and patient, we would eventually wake up in our beds, surrounded by our loving families. We might even be temporary celebrities at our school or work. It was not hard to fall into the sign of thinking. Part of me was hoping for the same thing. This group of players chose to wait. They stayed within the first city, using their initial allotment of money, measured in a currency known as coal, bit by bit, to buy food and cheap lodgings, grouping together in loose cliques. Fortunately, the town of Gaines took up nearly a fifth of the first floor, as large as one of the smaller wards of Tokyo. This meant that there was more than enough capacity for 5,000 players to sink, settle in without feeling cramped. But as time dragged on, there was no sign for help. Every waking moment brought the same scenery outside the castle. If a gloomy lit cover of lid looming overhead like a giant lid, their initial allotment of money wouldn't last forever, and the waiters would eventually have to do something. The second group made up about 30%. These 3,000 players decided that cooperation was the best chance of survival, the leader of the group was the manager of one of Japan's biggest websites about online gaming. Under his supervision, players were grouped together into smaller bands, sharing items and coal, and trading information about the labyrinths that housed the staircases to the next floor. The leader's group claimed the Black Iron Palace, the castle that loomed over the central square of the town of Beginnings, from which they sent instructions to smaller parties and accumulated supplies. This massive gathering was about a proper title for some time, but once they all started wearing the same uniform, the army label stopped being just a cute nickname. The third category, in which there were about a thousand people, were the ones who wasted their coal early, didn't feel like braving the monsters in the wilderness, and began to get desperate. Incidentally, given the virtual world of Sword Online, their inescapable urges of hunger and sleep, this made sense that you needed to sleep. Regardless of what the stimuli received are real or virtual, the brain needs to turn off and recharge at some point. 
players get tired, find inns, rent rooms that suit their pocketbooks, sink into their beds. With enough coal, it's possible to buy a residence in the town of your choice, but it's a monumental task. The hunger was more of a mystery, but we didn't like to imagine it. it presumably, our real bodies were being kept alive through some means of force feeding. Eating food in Sword Art Online doesn't actually fill our bellies in real life. Yet stuffing virtual bread or meat into your face will get rid of the hunger and make you feel sated. I'll have to ask a neurologist to explain how that works. On the other hand, once you start feeling hungry, it'll never go away until you eat. I don't think fasting in could actually end in starvation, but still a natural urge has incredibly hard to resist. So every day, players rush into pubs and restaurants run by NPCs stuffing their bellies with food and made of pure data. And that's where the digestive process ends, by the way. No use dwelling on the less pleasant aspects. Not enough about that. Most of the players who'd wasted their initial earnings and started going hungry wound up with no other choice but to join the army. After all, orders were easy to follow if they were the only way you got fed at the end of the day. But even in virtual worlds, there are those to whom cooperation is anathema. The ones who resisted joining any groups or got kicked out for causing trouble wound up inhabiting the slums of the town of beginnings, living a life of crime. The town inter interiors were a protected zone, where the system prevented players from harming each other, but there were no rules outside of town. Vagabonds teamed up with their own kind, avoiding monsters for the easier and more rewarding play, prey of unsuspecting adventurers. At least they didn't stoop to killing, for the first year. This screw up player grew over time to have reached my estimated count of around a thousand. The fourth and final category may as well be titled miscellaneous. Around 500 players who wanted to help conquer the game but didn't want to join the army formed roughly 50 smaller groups known as guilds. They were a positive force in our advancement through the army, using their limited resources more nimbly than the army's massive bureaucracy could manage. There was also the extreme minority of crafters and traders. These two to three hundred players formed guilds of their own, focusing on skills that would enable them to raise coal and make a living without fighting. The amazing several dozen adventurers, myself included, were the solo players. We were the individuals who chose to act alone rather than join any group, either out of self-interest or because we felt it was the most efficient means of survival. Most of the solos were former beta testers. We called upon our prior experiences to fly out of the gate at the game's start. But once we were powerful enough to handle monsters and robbers on our own, we found little reason to work with others. On top of that, Sword Art Online was a game without mag magic, in, for example, easy long range attacks, which meant that enemies were fairly easy to manage single hand, even when they came in groups. With proper skill, a good solo player could earn experience much faster than he could with a group. Not that this was without risk. For example, contracting paralysis while on a party just meant that somebody had to heal you. On your own, you could be a death sentence. The fatality rate among solo players was easily the highest of any category. With enough knowledge and experience to properly avoid danger, the returns easily outweighed the risks. And we beta testers had an advantage over the others in those categories. As the solos used their knowledge to far outpace the new players, serious friction developed between the new group the two groups, and when the initial chaos eventually settled, the solo players all left the first floor to sell in towns higher up. <coughs> then Black Iron Palace is a room formerly known as the Chamber of Resurrection. Since the beta test, a massive metallic epithet has appeared there, etched with the names of all 10,000 players. It had been thoughtfully designed such that when a player died, his or her name was very clearly crossed out of the time and cause of death printed next to it. It only took three hours for someone to earn the honor of being the first. The cause of death was not monsters, but suicide. The unfortunate victim claimed that due to the structure of the nerve gear, if we simply removed ourselves from the game system, we would automatically leave the program and regain consciousness on the other side. We climbed over the tall railing of the terrace on the south edge of the town, the very outer border of Einkrad itself, and threw himself down overboard. No matter how hard you peered down, there was never the slightest system of land or any other surface beneath Einkrad. Nothing but endless sky and layer upon layer of clouds. With the crowd at the terrace watching, 
The man's scream grew steadily fainter as he plummeted, until he finally disappeared through the cloud layer. Two minutes later, his name was unceremoniously, mercilessly crossed out on the monument. His cause of death fell from a great height. I don't want to think about what he experienced on that fall. Whether he reawoke in the real world or got brain fried, as Kyle claimed, was impossible to determine from within the game. But most players agreed if that was, if it were that easy to escape, it would all have been detached from the outside and rescued by now. Still, there were others here and there who also succumbed to the temptation of such a simple conclusion. It was extremely difficult to appreciate the concept of death within Sword Art Online. That still hasn't changed. The visual effects of polygons breaking apart when HP reaches zero is just too close to the game over screen, a harmless phenomenon familiar to all gamers. The only way to fully understand death in Sword Art Online is to experience it for oneself. I have no doubt that the mental distance from our supposed mortality was a major contributing factor to the decline in population. When the army, the other minor guilds, and the wait and see uh, types clogging the town of games finally started tackling the game itself, they started losing people to the monsters. Experience and instincts were necessary to win battles in Sword Art Online. The trick was not try doing everything on your own. You have to ride the system's automatic support. Take a single, single, up, angle-handed upward, up, uppercut slice. If you'd learn the one-handed swords category, and the upward slice is equipped in your list of sword skills, all you need to do is perform the proper motion, and the system will move your body automatically. If you don't have the skill equipped and try to mimic the movements on your own, the result will be so much slower and weaker. There's no point even trying it. In essence, the knack to combat in Sword Art Online was a bit like pulling off combos in a fighting game. Those who couldn't get the grasp of the system just swung their swords back and forth lamely, scuffling against even the weakest boars and wolves, enemies that were easily defeated with the most basic of initial skills. And even if your health was dwindling and the fight was proving difficult, there was always the option of disengaging and retreating to avoid death. Except that, unlike fighting 2D monsters on a simple TV screen, the incredible realism of Sword Art Online's world brought forth a kind of primal fear in its players. In every encounter, we were faced with actual monsters bearing wicked fangs, ready to charge and kill. Plenty of beta testers felt an initial panic when they first experienced the combat of Sword Art Online. That was nothing compared to fighting with the scepter of actual death overhead. When the grips of fear took over, Players forgot even the most basic of skills or dodges, becoming helpless targets as their hit points were torn from them. Suicide, death in combat, the lines and the epithet proliferated, unstoppable and uncaring. With the number of the dead topping 2,000 in just the first month, the remaining population was plunged into a black despair. If that mortality rate continued, we'd all be, have been dead within a half a year. Clearing all 100 fours was just a pipe dream. The thing about human beings is, we learn. After just over a month, it had, we had finally conquered the first floor of Einkrad. It took only 10 days for the second to fall, and by then the death rate was plummeting. As survival tips spread through the population, people began to realize that as long as they earned experience and gained levels, the monsters weren't so frightening after all. Maybe we can beat this game. Maybe we can get back to the real world. Confidence and optimism dared to beat their heads out once again. The top floor of Einkrad was impossibly far away. So that hope was enough to jumpstart us into motion. The world began ticking away again. It's been two years. There are 26 floors left to conquer, 6,000 survivors. Such is the present state of Einkrad. I hope you go forth and try to learn more about this wonderful world on your own. Until then, this is the Doctor Man signing off. I'm done here. I accomplished my goal.